Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you are watching or listening to this, and welcome to Link Up Leaders, your direct link to leaders in supply chain and e-commerce. My name is Lisa Kinski, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Francois Jaffray. Francois, how are you, dear? I'm great. How are you? Good. I, I think it's so funny. I have to wonder, because I know you wear glasses, and you don't wear them for the show, and I'm going to out you. I know you're flying blind. How much can you actually see? <laughs> oh, I could see. I, I could see most of it. It's just like, I can't see a license plate if I'm driving. Oh, Okay. It was a reason I had to retake calculus in college because like the minus and the division signs were actually the same to me oh, no. and the ones and the 11s were exactly the same too. So it's like, I can't see the small things, but I could see generally everything else that's going on. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. I didn't know if you were like my mom, like if my mom took her glasses off right now, like she would not even be able to differentiate between like the microphone and her computer screen. Oh, I, so yeah, I could see. All I always just assumed you were flying <laughs> totally blind over here. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead and jump in. Uh, we have a very familiar face with us today. We just wrapped up, well, I say we, you just wrapped up the um, e-commerce expansion roundtable series with him as well as Ryan and Jonathan. So joining us from the future, as Ryan likes to say, we have Paul Sonveld from Merchant Spring. Paul, how are you? I am well, guys. Uh, good to be with you this morning. Uh, I, I just listened in and talk about the glasses and I thought, there's just no way I'm going to take my glasses off, right? Because I wouldn't even know where the webcam is or the computer. So uh, <laughs> I'm just going to. I, I, I was going to ask you, Francois, like, you know, the license plate is interesting, but how about stop signs? You know, is that, you know, please tell me you recognize the difference between like a warning sign and a stop sign. And, <laughs> well, the, the yield, I could, I could tell the difference between an octagon and a triangle. And the yields are triangles okay. here. So I know when to actually do a full stop. So, like, yeah, yeah, even yeah, traffic yeah. lights. It, it's the the small thing like the arrow that's on the left hand side or like down at the bottom. I'm like, mm, does that mean like everyone is green or is that just a turning? <laughs> but <laughs> I just wear my glasses. I have to wear it's my a, glasses. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a bit like AI, right? You're just trying to recognize shapes, and then uh, you learn by trial and error. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, speaking of how many tickets do you have? No, we won't get into that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Paul, thank you for joining us so early in Australia time. So you're in, um, I, I will say it the correct way, Melbourne, I believe is how it's supposed to be pronounced. We call it Melbourne. Um, <laughs> and it's 6 a.m. <laughs> there. God bless you, hon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is uh, it is early. It's one of the joys of uh, running a global business from Melbourne, I think, uh, during COVID. We've had it pretty good, so it's been a good choice, but uh, other than that, time zones are uh, working against you a little bit. The only upside is, uh, as you mentioned before, I do get to see what the future holds. And in fact, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite willing to say that uh, it's going to be dry and cloudy today. Uh, so that's <laughs> something to look forward to when you wake up tomorrow morning. Beautiful. We have we have our own like built-in guaranteed weatherman. We should use this power. We'll text Paul every day. Every day. <laughs> <laughs> you let us know how it is every night. And we'll let yeah. you know how it is every night here. I'll, uh, I'll send you. Uh, you know, before you wake up, there'll be a little email in your inbox saying uh, what you should wear today. Today is shorts, singlets, <laughs> and what we call flip flops. That would be perfect. <laughs> That'd be awesome. <laughs> Well, other than being a master meteorologist, uh, let's get into your background. So, um, of course, we both tuned in actually to your episode on Ryan's show, Crossover Commerce, powered by Ping Pong Payments. Um, give him a little plug right there. But uh, why don't you go ahead and just tell everybody who maybe isn't familiar with you a little bit about your background and how you got started in e-com? Yeah, sure. Um, look, um uh, I'm going to keep this to at least a short 20 minute version. But uh, <laughs> look, uh, so first of all, uh, I grew up in Holland. That's why I've got a really funny accent. For any listeners, you know, I don't need to be think, thinking about this for the rest of the podcast. Let me put you out of your misery that the, the accent is Dutch, okay? Um, I moved to Australia about 30 years ago. Can't seem to get rid of the accent. Um, so I started life not in e-commerce, uh, not as an entrepreneur. I started my life as a management consultant, uh, surrounded by PowerPoint slides for about nine years. Uh, then I moved into physical good old store retail, uh, you know, with, with one of the larger retailers here in Australia. Then actually I jumped across to e-commerce, uh, working for one of the largest marketplaces, local ones here in Australia, uh, which is uh, a business now called The Catch Group. 
Uh, and then about four years ago, I started Merchant Spring. And the reason I decided to sort of jump out of corporate and um, really jump into this whole e-commerce and specifically marketplace space, because I, I was just so excited about the kind of what I would say the revolution that was going on, you know, lots of marketplaces opening up in Australia and all of a sudden, uh, you know, brand owners had all these new options uh, to drive their sales. Um, and you know, lots of opportunities to, to grow your sales and, and to reach incremental uh, audiences. So that's really why Merchant Stream was born. We have since evolved and, or I'd say, pivoted into becoming a global SaaS platform focused specifically on marketplace analytics. Uh, we are, what we're trying to solve is the pain point of giving you real clarity and insight into how your total business, e commerce business, is performing across multiple marketplaces, multiple uh, countries, multiple currencies, so that you can save a lot of time and really make better decisions. So right now, our platform connects to over 70 different marketplaces uh, globally, pretty much uh, most major ones in North America, Europe, uh, Australasia. Um, and you know the idea is really to, uh, to help businesses uh, save time and, uh, and run their business in a smoother, uh, clearer way and drive sales a lot harder. So uh, yeah, that's a bit about us. And so you just got the idea to create this platform and and help folks sell across marketplaces because you saw them emerging from the consumer perspective. You just like knew, hey, this is going to be big. Because I don't think that I I think I would just would have been like, oh, new website to buy patio furniture on. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. In terms of um, look, if you, if I put yourself in in the, in the in the shoes of like a brand owner, right? So this is about three years ago. Uh, you know, typically you'd sell your products through bricks and mortar retail, uh, you know, and bricks and mortar retail, you know, certainly here in Australia has been uh, doing okay, but not stellar, right? Lots, particularly certain categories really struggling. Uh, you know, even if you're doing well, your your sales may be growing like one or 2% a year, right? And, and, you know, you have to fight really hard for those sales and you know, you're struggling with private label offers of the retailers and you know, it's a really tough game. All of a sudden you've got e-commerce that's growing at double digits. Um, but if you if you lift up that bonnet and say what's really going on in e-commerce, actually you find that marketplaces are really taking that lion's share of all the growth. So yes, you can talk about oh let's set up you know a Shopify website and let's grow our things and look there's nothing nothing wrong with that. But what people often don't realize it requires a lot of money investment to to actually drive the traffic to get it to a meaningful position. In the meantime, you, you're sort of playing in you know, a what I'd say a I wouldn't say shrinking pool, but a pool that is not as growing as fast as what you see on marketplaces. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, how do you swim in that current that, that's flowing in the right direction? Uh, and that's where we really saw the uh, the marketplaces opportunity. Yeah, that's a uh, and first of all, uh, I'm never going to present after you after uh, the e-commerce <laughs> expansion uh, roundtable. Um, We're going in alphabetical I, order I, next time. I, yeah, but I did learn so much about so many different marketplaces um, in regards to. Um, I, I I think the biggest thing, actually, just to take that back, the biggest thing when I talk to U.S. based sellers or uh, even foreign sellers that sell within the U.S. is that they're so focused within the U.S. Um, and I think you dropped a crazy statistic that was it 63% of all e-commerce uh, global sales were done in Southeast Asia last year. Was that the statistic? I, I believe so. I think that was my statistic, but obviously oh, right. Southeast okay. Asia is an absolute uh, powerhouse in terms of, uh, a, you know, what's interesting about Southeast Asia, you've got massive, massive population there. Uh, certainly in places like Indonesia, um, you have lots of marketplaces there, uh, but actually overall disposable income is still quite low. So there's a lot of latent growth that's really going to happen in, uh, in Southeast Asia, which makes it very, very interesting. And so how does someone use Merchant Spring to see where, or I guess the better question is, does, some, does a new business owner use Merchant Spring to see what other marketplaces would be good fits for their products, or should they already know which marketplaces they plan to go in and then use Merchant Spring to sort of aggregate the data for it? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a bit of both, but more on the latter. So uh, we certainly work with a lot of clients to help them explore 
you know, if you're already on Amazon uh, or you're on uh, Lazada, say in Southeast Asia, uh, and you're strong in a particular geography, you know, what's the right next marketplace for you? You know, uh, you know, and we go through things like, um, you know, where is it, where is there a good fit? Which marketplace ensures that they actually you've got a good incremental audience as opposed to just going after the same audience? Um, you know, which one fits well with your supply chain? Uh, you know, can you get the price realization? All those things. So we do provide, uh, you know, more of an advisory service in that space. Um, our platform is really geared towards predominantly what I call professional sellers. So what I mean by that is um, well-established marketplace sellers that are typically e-commerce uh, and in some, most instances even sort of Amazon first businesses. So these are businesses that, uh, you know, selling on Amazon is their main game and they have expanded to other marketplaces over time. So, you know, very, a typical example might in, in, in North America might be a seller who's selling on um, Amazon, Walmart, you know, maybe they still have an eBay store as well. Uh, they, they may have run the Shopify store as well, and maybe they're on Amazon Canada. So, you know, the ability, you know, where we fit in is to say, all right, here is a really sophisticated dashboard that, that links in all of these marketplaces and shows you sales, operational, and profit information all together in one place so that you, know, you don't have to spend time analyzing it and we'll just put a spotlight straight on where we believe the opportunities are for you as a seller to grow sales or profit uh, faster. So mm -hmm. yeah, our platform is very much focused on the on more of the professional seller side as opposed to uh, those that are starting out. Yeah, and, and did I just see, uh, and I don't know if it was recent or if it's, uh, I, I'm just living under a rock. Did you just start bringing Walmart data into Merchant Spring? Yes, yes. We, we have been doing it for a while. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, we, we, we just sort of got the, the formal press release from Walmart earlier this week to say that, you know, we are now uh, That's what an I saw. official Walmart solutions provider, which, uh, you know, which is absolutely awesome, right? So Walmart, uh, we have been, you know, that with Amazon, eBay and Shopify for a while, uh, you know, to be part of the Walmart uh, ecosystem is, uh, is really exciting. Um, uh, let me tell you, those guys take that very seriously. Um, quite a few hoops, you know, quite a few of these early morning calls and, and hoops to jump through with their uh, with their technical team. But, you know, they have been amazing. And it's it's really great to be part of Walmart, especially because Walmart is, is growing, uh, you know, very fast. Uh, there's a lot of sellers sort of, you know, moving on there. And sort of the toolkit available for sellers in that space is still quite limited. So, you know, it's really fantastic to be to be part of that. And it was, it was nice to see the post earlier this week or last week, I think it was. Mm. Congratulations! That's that's a huge accomplishment. That's awesome. It's uh, yeah, no, it was nice. It was it was very nice to see. Yeah, I, I imagine that's only going to get better and better as they start to bring on more third party sellers too, mm -hmm. um, with with just better data and and better analytics from that data. Um, but the question I had aside from that was, when does a professional seller start to even consider branching out to new marketplaces? Um, uh, is there like a certain number or a certain number of SKUs that they have to hit or a certain period of time that they have to be seeing certain margins? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. Right? And, and by the way, the, you know, the, the, the opinions on this vary enormously. I run a poll on LinkedIn and uh, it was amazing <laughs> to ask exactly this question. Uh, and it was amazing to see what, what, what people uh, would say. But there's certainly a big camp. So let's say, let's assume you are on Amazon, right? That's where you've started. You've been running for a while. Uh, you know, when you ask the question, where do you go next? You know, there's certainly, I would say, you know, some real big Amazon loyalists that would say, no, there's always more you can drive on Amazon. There's always more you can do. And, you know, in some sense, I completely agree with that. Um, but let's just assume that, you know, you've been on Amazon for a while. Let's say you've been there three, four years. You've got a small... Uh, portfolio of, of FBA SKUs, you own your brand, you're running some great advertising campaigns, you know, you've got great ranking on those products, uh, you know, and everything is, is humming quite nicely and that's delivering some really good profits for you, right? So then the question becomes, so let's say you're doing, uh, I don't know, you know, $5 million a year on Amazon, which is, you know, which is a nice, sizable business. Where do you go next, right? So to, to me, this is all about thinking through, uh, you know, what incremental complexity do I take on versus, uh, you know, the return. So, yes, on Amazon, you could start to expand and source more products, right? So that is, that is a, you know, 
be a strategy. Um, you know, try and uh, say if you've got five SKUs, get another five, try and get them to the same position and try and maybe double your business. That's certainly uh, a valid strategy, but you do have to keep in mind that that requires, you know, additional um, energies and efforts in terms of sourcing, you know, product development, and you know, mo most importantly, working capital. And then, of course, you know, as you would know, Francois, you know, logistics, shipping, you know, some of the mess, the biggest pain points that exist right now in, in the whole ecosystem. So that's certainly a valid strategy, but you then weigh that up against, well, actually, I do have an existing set of products. They're already sitting probably in a 3PL warehouse, uh, you know, in North America somewhere. And, you know, where do I go next, right? So, uh, you know, obviously an easy option would be, so let's look at, say, Amazon Canada, or, uh, you know, probably Canada first, Mexico, you know, not so much. Mexico is a lot smaller, and obviously you've got a language issue there. Um, Mexico, Canada is interesting because, you know, the ecosystem is the same. Uh, in terms of Amazon. So you're not having to learn a whole new platform. You already have the products in North America. Um, so the incremental effort to actually start reaching a Canadian audience is quite small. So that might be a really good first step. You know, and then you can sort of work through the same sort of logic, right? So the next decision might be, well, actually, is Walmart a good option for me? Or do I go with Amazon elsewhere? And obviously, with Walmart, I'm having to learn a new platform. A new technology and you can set up another you know vendor account or seller account with walmart that does drive inherent complexity but the beauty is i probably have created a lot of the content for amazon that i can reuse the products are already there um so you know again you know what's the marginal complexity uh, increase because of that um you know and then you start to look at you know international markets so uh, you know and for amazon sellers certainly amazon is a is a is, is easy to expand internationally because the platform is 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 a you know, in Europe, it's pretty much identical. Here in Australia, Amazon is, is like a subset of what you see in the US. So the learning curve is like super, super easy. But of course, there is the physical stock movement, uh, you know, and, and things like VAT registration that does come up. So yeah, it's uh, that's sort of the process that I think is, is quite useful just to think through, okay, I've got an established business, where do I go next? And, you know, to sum it up, it's for me, it's it's about how do you trade up the opportunity for incremental sales versus the, the additional complexity that you take on, uh, you know, as a business. Hmm. And how would, like, I, I think back to this podcast that I saw, it was on lunch with Norm. He had interviewed a guest who was living in Australia. And I think she was talking about doing, uh, like, product popularity in different industries, you know, in different countries, because she was like, Australians are not as patriotic as Americans. We're not as religious. And we do not care about our dogs like you guys do. And I'm like, <laughs> those are all like, those are huge, like products here, especially like the dog stuff. So like, how, I guess, how, how would a seller know, like, if they are selling, you know, a dog product here in the US that's doing super, super well, and they're like on Amazon and on Walmart, you know, how would they know which countries that's also going to perform well in? Yeah, look, that's a, that's a really valid question, and and also a bit of a watch out because if you're used to selling on um, on Amazon in the US, uh, you know, you've got to keep in mind that you know Amazon has an enormous position in the US market. In that you know that you know, and you guys know this better than me, right? But um, you know, it, it's so common for people just to buy or any of their needs from Amazon, you know, and have boxes show up pretty much on a daily basis, right? Um, Amazon hasn't yet reached that. So, so let's take sort of complete contrast here. In Australia, you know, Amazon hasn't reached that position yet. You know, they are they are sort of the the, the second marketplace. Marketplaces overall don't yet have the adoption uh, that that marketplaces have in the US. And therefore, the overall demand on that marketplaces a is smaller, but also there's obviously the population size that's a lot smaller. So, mm -hmm. you know, not all not all products that are viable in North America will be viable here. Right, There's, there may not just be enough demand right now. It may grow, but you certainly won't, particularly when you're talking like niche products, you won't do the, the sort of volume. On the flip side, so you know that's sort of you know why why you shouldn't even think about this. On the on the flip side, though, um, the level of competition on on say some of the other Amazon markets, and you know it varies dr dramatically. But again, let me take talk about Australia as an example. You know that the competition is is. Almost, I wouldn't say insignificant, there's certainly competition, but nowhere near uh, in the level of competition, say, in the U.S. So, you know, not only uh, is the competition significantly less, you know, just look at things like buy box, you know, in the, in, in the U.S., it's not, it's not uncommon to see, like, 22 different sellers competing for a buy box. 
Mm. You know, here in Australia, if you can find a listings with, with, with three competitors on it, you know, you probably have to spend half an hour looking for it, right? So uh, the competition is less, but also the sophistication in the seller is less. So a lot of businesses, certainly say in Australia, not used to the whole ecosystem, certainly looking at Amazon as, you know, it's just one option, you know, amongst my own website and, and other marketplaces. So they're not pouring in that energy and, uh, and investment. So there's an opportunity to be had as well. Um, in terms of products, uh, look, I would, you know, obviously there's some really great tools in terms of doing product research and niches, but you know, one other place to start is if you're already familiar with a particular category in terms of selling on Amazon, that's useful, right? Because Amazon does place restrictions on you or, you know, there's hoops and if you're, if you're selling, you know, pet food, there'll be things you'll have to do to make sure you're, um, you're authorized and the like. If you already know that, then I would start to look at, you know, pet food and, and just look at, let's look at, you know, some of the key search results. Let's look at the top ranking products. Literally look at some of those products and go, right, can I, off the top of my head, think of five things I'd do, I'd do better, right? Yeah, I, can, I could offer that product. I think I could source it for a good price. Actually, you know, the top selling product isn't, isn't, isn't even an FBA, so I'll put an FBA, I'll put some advertising on it. I think I can develop much better product content. So, you know, it's, it's quite opportunistic in that sense. And, mm -hmm. you know, yes, you use detailed research tools, but also just visual inspection of, of the current competition and the current offer will tell you a lot about where you can focus to. Hmm. And do those other markets have the same research tools as here in the U.S., like uh, Jungle Scout, Helium 10? And does Merchant Spring offer any product research? We, uh, let me, let me, unfortunately, we don't. Uh, we're sort of more in the business of providing analytics once hmm. you start selling. Um, what we do offer, though, is, is we're one of the few platforms that support all Amazon regions globally right including some of the newest marketplaces so unfortunately where a, a lot of the existing tools i mean there are great tools you mentioned helium 10 uh you know jungle scout uh, you know there's a whole plethora of tools out there uh, and they're great tools uh, not all of them support every single amazon market so most uh, i would say support america or the united states or north america and uh, most of europe very few support really the emerging markets like you know India or the Middle East or you know Australia and Japan for that reason. So um, it's worth just checking up the the offer does become the, the number of tools that you can use does tend to shrink a little bit once you sort of go outside the main Amazon markets. Mm. Yeah. Do you think, uh, especially with Walmart having such a big push, and I imagine other companies are going to follow suit. Uh, companies like uh, like Target, I would imagine. I, I think they had a launch what back in might have been 2012 or 2015, and then they closed it off, and then they tried it again with like another soft launch. I think it was that. Was it Target? Paul? Uh, yeah, yeah uh, I, I can't remember the exact history about when they launched, but certainly Target right now uh, they do they're being very quiet and considerate. So, you know, they only have a couple of hundred sellers uh, on there at the moment on their Target Plus. So they sort of revamped it about a year ago, relaunched it. Um, but I'm hearing a lot of positive noises uh, mm. coming out of, uh, out of Target. So the sellers that, that managed to, uh, to be on Target um, are, are really very happy about it. Uh, to the extent there's a lot of other, you know, I often get asked, oh, how do I get on Target? What can I do? Uh, I you know, unfortunately, it's not easy at the moment. I feel like they're really taking it, you know, being taking it carefully, making sure they've got everything right before they open up. Uh, but that's to me, that's probably my number one marketplace to watch in terms of uh, the next opportunity in the next two to three years, because uh, it's mm -hmm. looking pretty good right now. Yeah, and I, I where I was going with that is just with with the emergence of these new marketplaces, uh, you know, like Walmart recently launching with uh, what is it? What, is it called Walmart Plus or Walmart? Uh, the the online marketplace for Walmart. I forgot exactly what yeah. it's called. Uh, yeah, yeah. I like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, but what, yeah, it depends. Yeah, but but where I was going with that is with the emergence of these markets, I would imagine that more tools are going to start to become more available, like the product research, like keyword research, and and things like that. Um, do you see any sort of time frame? for how that was developed. I'm not sure if we can equate that to, to Amazon 
just because everyone kind of Amazon's this giant beast where everyone sort of got in very early and then they started getting together with the service provider section of Amazon and then merging there. Um, but do you have any expectations for, you know, building out these, uh, these different uh, offerings? From a, do you mean from a broader market point of view, the dynamics? Yeah, yeah. Or, um, or it could be like Walmart specific or Target, whatever, you know, yeah, yeah, you yeah. have the inside scoop on. <laughs> well, it's, um, you know, what, what is interesting is you, you do see right now, like the multi-marketplace space is becoming really interesting because there's certainly a trend now where sellers are going on multiple marketplaces, right? So I, I don't know the statistic for the U.S., but you know, here in Australia, like two, three years ago, you know, the, the average number of marketplace that a market marketplaces that a seller would sell, you know, it's probably just over two, right? Two point something. But now it's probably closer to four or five, right? So because people are always looking at, okay, what's the incremental marketplace I can go on? Uh, you know, and, and I think we see the same trend happening, uh, you know, in, in the United States and in Europe, N not necessarily to the same degree because the market structures are different. But there's a natural shift to say, right, you know, how can I grow my sales? I've set up all this infrastructure. Where do I go next? I and mean, it relates a little bit to our previous previous conversation. Um, and what's interesting, you see, a lot of the, the larger platforms, they are starting to develop, uh, you know, tools, a bit like what we're doing. Um, so, you know, the best example, for example, is uh, is Jungle Scout. You know, they recently raised, you know, a phenomenal amount, like $110 million dollars. Um, and really, with, they they did that for two two reasons. One, they 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 wanted to buy you know more advertising capability, so they made an acquisition. The other thing they'll talk about is you know how do they take the functionality that they've developed and start to build that for Walmart uh, and other marketplaces in the US. So you know the the some of the bigger players in this ecosystem are you know, are recognizing that uh, you know you need to provide you know multi marketplace functionality, just being really good in one uh, one particular marketplace is going to lead to disappointment because your customers are going to ask, well, can you do this for Walmart or can you do this for that or uh, and the like. So, in fact, <laughs> I had the same question from uh, from a Dutch agency this morning saying, well, you, you've, you've done uh, advertising for Amazon. Can I now have that same set of features for uh, a local marketplace over here? So um, it's uh, you can see where the customer need is and, and you know, it just becomes like, because they've got something over here, they start to expect it over here as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely how things are evolving, at least the way I see it. Mm. Yeah, that that'll be fun. That that'll be really fun once uh, once more sellers are able to get onto more marketplaces. And uh, I just, as a consumer, I can't wait to start seeing the price wars on the different marketplaces themselves. Uh, because I want to benefit there. <laughs> I want to find the coupons that they forget to turn off. I want to find the savings that they forgot to, uh, you know, uh, turn off also. And the, uh, so I'm super excited for that. Plus, uh, if there's Amazon Prime Day, I, I'm sure Walmart, Target, all these different marketplaces are also going to follow suit. Um, mm -hmm. So there's sure. more opportunity, of course, for us to just spend money mindlessly like Americans do. Mm -hmm. um, Is expanding outside of Walmart just looking at that lowest barrier of entry? And do those different marketplaces help Amazon sellers come onto their marketplace from Walmart? Um, it, it's something I know I've seen in a lot of uh, just Walmart group, Walmart.com groups in general. A lot of them just th they are successful Amazon sellers on there, but they don't quite understand Walmart yet. And I would imagine Walmart would make it easy for them because they would want them to to bring their inventory on. But do you have any uh, any insights on that? Yeah, what I would say is, you know, those that sell on Amazon are very used to the tools that Amazon has developed. You know, and and remember, Amazon. I can't remember when Amazon entered this sort of the marketplace three P space. But I'm gonna I'm gonna say something like they've been at it for at least fifteen years or so. You know, quite quite a long time, I think. Um, and as a result, they've developed all these really sophisticated tools, right? Um, soliciting reviews, advertising, you know, you name it. Um, and actually to replicate that, that functionality for sellers is not, a, is not an easy feat, right? So, so you, you, you look at the functionality that, that, say, Walmart offers right now in their back end for sellers or via the APIs, you know, it's hard to put a number on it, but right now I would say it, it's sort of 30 to 40% of what Amazon currently offers. So... Um, 
you know, you don't have all the bells and whistles uh, that, 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 that Amazon offers. And it's also harder to develop all those bells and whistles in terms of tools and the like. Um, so that can lead to some frustration, uh, you know, and certainly, you know, some things don't seem to work as well as people are expect, have expected on Amazon. Um, having said that, you know, some things on Amazon are still fraught with friction, uh, take a lot of time, uh, are not easy. So, you know, each marketplace is, is different in that respect. Um, I do know um, that certainly the, the challenger marketplaces, they are investing very heavily in seller acquisition and onboarding, right? So the big marketplaces like Amazon is very much like, you know, you sign up, you set up everything yourself, it's, it's self-service. Uh, their model is more about, you know, we, we find, we work with the right sellers, we pick the right sellers that are a good fit for us, and then we'll provide you support in terms of onboarding, getting your products done, uh, you know, making sure you understand the whole ecosystem and the like. So quite a different approach. And I think they have to, because otherwise, uh, you know, it'd be hard to, you know, play that catch-up game, that throw more resource at it, is, is sort of what we see. Mm -hmm. So with, with these other larger marketplaces kind of making it a little bit easier for the sellers to be onboarded and stuff, what is like the number one mistake that you still see sellers make when they are looking to expand to new international markets? The largest, uh, there's probably, there's a few, uh, the ones that come to mind right now is, first one is content. So, the typical the typical mistake I see sellers make is that they've got great content for a marketplace, let's say Amazon, and they will then just upload that content onto another marketplace without really giving careful consideration in terms of you know what is the style guide of that marketplace, how do you create optimized listings uh, for that marketplace uh, in such a way that you really drive great organic ranking. So not optimizing your content for you know, the new marketplace is, is certainly, uh, you know, a, a key issue that I see uh, because there's a bit of a, you know, there's a bit of a sort of like, I just take the content, it works on Amazon, so therefore I just throw the same stuff onto, onto Walmart or elsewhere, I should just get a really good result as well. Doesn't always work just because the search algorithms are different, there's different style guides, different approval processes and the like. So invest in, in optimizing the content for every single marketplace you sell on. Uh, that would be my number one. Um, the other one, particularly when it comes to the, the things that we tend to run in when you get to selling internationally is different markets, different countries will have different regulations around um, product groups uh, or product categories, uh, whether you can sell them, you know, what are the legislative requirements, what are the labeling requirements, what are the compliance certificates, all of that uh, you need to see. Doing that research up front is, is what a lot of people tend to forget. So, you know, I've, I've seen situations time and time again where a product sells really well uh, in, in a market, let's fucking say, say in the US, um, there is an opportunity to sell that product in another market, let's say in Europe, um, you know, container is loaded up, you know, listings are created, off we go, only to find out that uh, it's not possible to sell that product yet. You know, there are, you know, there's additional hoops to jump through in terms of, um, you know, product labeling or demonstrating that the product is safe for the European audience and the like. And, and that whole compliance piece can really set you back uh, and, and, you know, could drive significant additional cost uh, if you haven't considered that that upfront. So that's certainly a second, second area where we see uh, a lot of sellers make mistakes. Yeah. It, it, where would they even go to to sort of clarify that compliance? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question because there is no, I have not yet found like, what is the clear one source of truth and that will answer all your things there. Um, clearly local, you know, it's always good to partner with, with, with people on the ground, right? Whether it be marketplace agencies, whether it be people like, you know, Vet Global, you know, Jonathan, those guys. Um, it's always a good port of call because Chances are they have gone through that process with other customers and clients lots of times, and they they're probably good at just giving you some pointers and helping you to, to avoid all those rookie mistakes. Um, but you know, there's always you know do your own due diligence. You know, the the thing that I always the two checks that I always do is uh, you know we'll look at you know, within Europe um, 
you know, there's different authorities that look after different regulations. Quickly Google them, find out, you know, in for the category that you have, what are their restrictions? What are their labeling requirements? Uh, you know, those sorts of things. And then secondly, so let's say if you are selling, want to sell on Amazon in, in Europe or on another marketplace, now I know Amazon will have a whole section on restricted products, for example. So again, you know, really dive into that. It's a bit messy and unstructured, but dive into that and really try and find out uh, what is it that Amazon's going to ask you when you try and list or, or bring these products into an Amazon warehouse. You know, try and do that research up front. Um, but yeah, Google is your friend, right? Uh, good place to start. Good place to start. We're big fans. We're huge yeah. fans of Google. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, Google has everything. I, I, I was even going to say, you know, it, it's. Uh, I hope there's going to be a time where I see Merchant Spring pull in some AI and find product compliance because that would be awesome itself. Uh, just hey, you're looking to go into Southeast Asia and to Vietnam specifically, you're not compliant unless you have these other certifications. That could be mm -hmm. good, good future for you. That'd be <laughs> so cool. <laughs> That would be awesome. Uh -oh. Really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I didn't spoil anything <laughs> for your future plans. No, no. Um, always, always looking for good ideas, and that's a good one. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Uh, don't forget the royalties. But uh, <laughs> but when it comes to uh, to expanding onto uh, Walmart, because I, I, I do see this huge emergence, particularly on Walmart. Um, and I know that they have this separate onboarding experience, but why don't they just, and this is my question for most platforms, but Walmart specifically, why don't they just have like a course of, hey, if you sold on Amazon, these are the modules that you typically see on Amazon. This is how it's done on Walmart. That's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> certainly if, if I was, uh, but it's interesting when you, when you look at, um, Amazon and you think about who are, who are the people doing all the trading. It's actually not Amazon themselves, right? They have, mm -hmm. you know, what they call, you know, Amazon, I think it's Amazon in a universe or seller university or, you know, and there's some stuff there. Uh, but really it's, it's the, say the, the helium tender, the freedom ticket or the, mm. the freedom cause of jungle scout. It's those things that, that seem to be driving a lot of the education across the piece. Um, and look, I wouldn't be surprised if, if I haven't come across any, I'm sure there are, some people are already venturing into this, um, especially now, actually. So I'm not sure whether you guys sort of saw this, but I think it was about three months ago, and I might have got the timing slightly off, where, where Walmart made uh, a bit of a strategic change to the seller acquisition piece. So up until that point, um, they put a lot of restrictions around who could sell on Walmart. You know, essentially, you know, to sort of summarize, they said you have to be a recognized brand in the U.S., yeah, and you have to be domiciled in the US. So it's not just, you know, mm. just because you're a warehouse in the US, that's not good enough. You really need to be. It's, it's almost like saying we need to be able to find you, uh, you know, in one of our stores or, you know, uh, you, need to, you need to be known with the audience. Um, about three months ago, they, they flipped that um, because, and they said, actually, we are now going to open up Walmart Marketplace internationally for any international seller that wants to come on. Now, obviously, there's still a bit of due diligence, uh, you know, and all of that, but, they really open, you know, open the gates um, for a lot of sellers uh, to really come on board. In fact, uh, we know that they were, they're actively recruiting, for example, in China to get Chinese sellers mm. uh, onto their uh, onto their platform as well. So, with that whole influx of sellers, you know, I, I'm sure, uh, you know, the need for training courses and the like is it, just going to skyrocket. Because um, yeah, there's definitely we know from an Amazon point of view, people are hungry and thirsty for for knowledge and how, you know, it's their business, right? Who doesn't want to know how to run a better business? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and those same questions will be valid for Walmart. So um, yeah, I'm surprised actually, you know, once you asked the question, I'm like, oh, surprised. I haven't really seen anyone do that yet, but you know, I'm sure, uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about entering this space. Oh, yeah. yeah, with, with new marketplaces, funny. it's, yeah, it's going to be a lot of new opportunities, uh, definitely mm -hmm. again, for these service providers and, Unfortunately, also, you know, a lot of uh, misinformation is going to be out there, though, and uh, people are going to make courses that are way too expensive and provide less value than they are, are worth. But I, that's just how it is. That's the nature of, of courses. Um, and that's why you have the great ones and you have the ones that will just take your money and run. Um, so definitely do your due diligence on whichever course that you go through, no matter where you're going, yeah. <laughs> is the life it's lesson. 
Do, yeah, do yeah. your due diligence on any service provider you go with, friends. There are <laughs> freight forwarders who will also take your money and run. Uh, a lot of people saw that earlier this year. So just always do your research. <laughs> Google is your friend. <laughs> By the way, anyone listen, I will also take anyone's money, but I won't run. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know. Any, well, we anyone locked into the island down there. <laughs> any anyone that wants to sign up for our tool and pay like ten years in advance for the subscription fees, you know, I'm I'm completely open to that. Uh, they, so, yeah, they could start funding the AI product compliance for go. the future use, and they could get first That's access it. to it. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. Uh, but what uh, coming back to to expansion? Um, because it, it's it's just such a vast topic. Uh, uh, aside from the mistakes that I know uh, you outlined earlier, when it comes to data um, and tracking data, because uh, like you said earlier, you know, those that are on Amazon, they're very comfortable with Amazon. They know what metrics to track. Um, does uh, Merchant Spring also tell them what data points they're able to get from other marketplaces and what's similar to Amazon? Yeah, so um, the way our platform works, I would say 80% of the the data is homogenous across marketplaces. And we've done that deliberately so, because if you're selling a particular product, um, you, you want to, and let's say you're selling that across, you know, Amazon US, Walmart, Shopify, and, and the UK, right? You want to know, like you want to maximize your profit and, and reduce your working capital associated with that product, right? So what you want to know is, you know, you want to be able to compare across marketplaces. You want to quickly say, right, first of all, what does my pricing look like for that particular product across each marketplace just to make sure it sort of hangs together? You know, what is my, my rate of sale? What is my inventory associated with each of these? You know, and, and then what does my day's cover look like? You know, I want to make sure that I, I balance my inventory in the right spot against the sales opportunity. All right. So there's nothing worse with uh, having all your stock sitting, you know, against the marketplace that doesn't sell. All right. That will be terrible. Uh, but then, you know, next from there, you go, right. What about profitability? Right, I can see this product is making me 37% margin, or on a unit cost basis, I'm making $11 US every time I sell this product. Net, net, net. Right? Oh, on Walmart, I'm I'm making 13. Right? Uh, and in Amazon UK, I might be making 16. Okay, now that's interesting. So, you know, maybe that means on Walmart in the US, I can spend a little bit more on advertising and still drive a bit more, and and I can do the same in the UK. And actually, I'm gonna reshift my energy and focus to balance the sales a little bit more away from Amazon in the US to some of the other marketplaces and therefore, you know, ultimately, as any other business owner is interested in, you know, grow the overall profits uh, that I'm driving from this. So now in order to do that, you really need to have homogenous data. You need to be able to compare apples and apples, not just within a marketplace, but across marketplaces, uh, you know, and that's where it becomes, you know, really interesting uh, from, for those sellers that sell across multiple marketplaces, you know, how do I essentially drive a greater return on the capital that I've got invested in my business by, by having a really good lens of how things are working across every single marketplace that I sell on. Hmm. And uh, across the different marketplaces, uh, so there's the data, but there there's also the different processes, right? So Amazon, when someone returns something, there's the return process for Amazon, Walmart's different, Home Depot, Lowe's, I imagine Target's going to be different. Is that something that can easily be managed in Merchant Spring also? Or is that something where you still have to go in and, and sort of, I guess, use their platforms? Yeah, the um, a lot of that we will surface in our application. So uh, the, the typical thing would be um, seller health. So, yeah. you know, um, typically... You know, seller health, as many of your listeners will know, on Amazon is absolutely critical, right? So uh, if, you know, that's sort of, you know, your seller health can either be good at risk or your store is closed, right? So if your store ever gets closed or suspended, um, you know, you are in a world of pain. You know, there's ways to, sometimes there's ways to recover from that. But, you know, imagine if you were doing, uh, you know, $100,000 a week and all of a sudden somebody turns that tap off, you know, and even when you turn it back on, it takes a long time. You you're, you won't be in the same position in terms of you know, organic ranking uh, as where you left off. So seller managing your seller health and as soon as an issue pops up, being able to uh, resolve that is is very very critical. Uh, and that's why you know in our app you can see your Amazon Amazon health really you know with a click of a button uh, you know with alerts and all that so you can stay all over that and you know save yourself lots of time in terms of uh, logging on. 
Uh, you know, we do the same for other operational metrics, and you know, we do things like uh, Amazon review automation. Mm. So, uh, you know, right now, um, if you're, you know, Amazon got rid of the uh, early review program. I'm not sure whether you guys are aware of that. So, mm -hmm. it's actually a lot harder now to get reviews on both your products and uh, and you as a seller. So, um, you know, the only way to do that right now is to uh, go into the Amazon backend, look at your orders. If your order's been delivered, you can then you know, click the request a review button, right? Now imagine being a seller that sells thousands of, you know, has thousands of orders, you know, a day or a week. You know, you're going to have to hire three people just to click that, sit there, click that button all day. Uh, very time consuming uh, and, and pretty mundane process. So, you know, one of the things that we've, we've built in and we'll be launching this next week is what we call automated review, uh, you know, automated Amazon reviews. So you can just say, right, let's turn on automation. And let's target these types of orders and send re requests for review out automatically. Start soliciting reviews automatically, you know, within with the Amazon approved template. So you don't have to spend all of that time doing that. So, you know, we're evolving our platform to, to really start taking away all of that sort of admin time associated with, with Amazon and marketplace backends. So that you can, you know, reinvest more of that in terms of you know, driving your strategies to grow sales and profits. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, reviews are invaluable, particularly in that marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that they are in, in any marketplace. I mean, what's the first thing that you do when you go to buy a product? You identify it's what you need and then you check the reviews to see if it's worth anything. I mean. Oh, I just check the price and check out. <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> I, I just check the price. If it seems reasonable, I'm like, okay. Oh, that's I mean, why with you Amazon... know so much about returns. That's why I don't return anything because I read the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm halfway in between by the way I go like give me the best price and then I go oh that price is too good to be true let's check the reviews to make sure they're really legit <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. Do I, I guess it depends also if I'm getting like dog food or something that I know that I, I've gotten before I'm like whatever I'm just gonna buy it um, and if it's cheap I'm, I don't care about reviews It's it's if it's five ten dollars they scam me out of five ten dollars. Yeah. I, I really should have lost that five ten dollars. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I, I did have a question at the beginning. It just popped back in. Uh, when we started seeing Amazon start to put in all these restrictions and fluctuate IPIs and limit inventory that you could send in, did you notice an uptick in those that are uh, either? We don't have to talk about the you know the signups, but those that are starting to look at other marketplaces by itself, uh, with either within the U.S. or internationally. The uh, yeah, look, this is this is probably the number one topic that we are uh, that, that's certainly creating a lot of angst uh, and concern, um, particularly when it comes to why well, you know people ask us two things: show me my IPI score, you know, because I'm really really concerned about this and. This seems to be moving like Amazon's policies on this particular piece seem to be moving literally on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. right? Where they're kind of, you know, redefining, you know, what's bulky, what's not, you know, what's long term, all of that. Um, so, you know, clearly they're in a big space of, you know, how do we start optimizing uh, days cover in our warehouses, you know, and really, you know, uh, you know improve efficiencies along the, along the supply chain there. But then you get into these interesting discussions, right, where... You know, Amazon now makes it really hard to send products directly into their FBA warehouse. So, you know, I've got stock on the water already. Now I'm going to have to put it into a 3PL warehouse, uh, you know, maybe somewhere in Europe or North America before I can then send a portion of that to Amazon because Amazon's more restricted. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's that's kind of painful, additional and costly. But what is interesting is now I'm sitting in a 3PL warehouse. Maybe I should be thinking about sending my stock to other places as well. Uh, mm -hmm. So it does kind of, open up that opportunity, right? So, well, actually I could send it to, you know, uh, you know, maybe I can start selling things on eBay. I know sort of India and North America is not what it used to be. So, you know, um, but in other markets, you know, eBay is still really sizable and, and, and quite big. Um, but maybe that's an option. Maybe I actually time to deploy a Shopify store, you know, and fulfill straight from that warehouse. So it does, I would say Amazon does, has made it, kind of a bit easier for sellers to start thinking about options uh, in that sense, because, you know, everyone, what, what do people want? They, they don't want to have lots of working capital tied up in, in, you know, in another 
warehouse that's that's incurring costs for them. So again, if they can start amortizing their costs through all the channels, you know, if you're a seller, why wouldn't you look at it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, and it just seems that it would make the next log. It, it would make sense for their next step to be once they have inventory sitting in a 3PL um, and not just an Amazon FBA for them to sign up to Merchant Spring IO, find out what those other marketplaces are, identify the opportunity, see what the lower lowest uh, sor sort of barrier to entry to those marketplaces are also, um, and then get in and start selling those same products. Um, but that also means there's going to be a huge uh, lag. And, and we have seen that there was that big lag between those that uh, traditionally were sending thousands and thousands containers of, uh, of units into Amazon FBA directly. And now they're depending on 3PLs and 3PLs just didn't know what to do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, they might have been shipping out a few hundred every day, a few hundred units. I, I know we were. And then we saw that boom up as soon as people started buying during holiday season, particularly truckers didn't know what to do. Uh, I mean, they started putting limits on like Macy's and Nike and and all these big box retailers even um, for how many trailers can even pick up from those locations. Um so I, I think Amazon didn't necessarily shoot itself in the foot, but it did, like you said, it create this huge opportunity for uh, sellers to, to see what the next marketplace that they could be selling is. Um, was there any sort of trend in which marketplaces they were looking to next from Amazon? It's, um, I would say yes, but it varies very much by geography, right? Um, yeah. So. You know, we've spoken a lot about US, so maybe let me give you some insights into uh, into Europe. So you know, there's, there's certainly there are a number of marketplaces that are um, that are kind of really up and coming, um, and it depends a little bit on, on the category that you're in because some of them are category specific, like uh, you know, Zalando is, is very much focused on fashion. But you know, sort of more general purpose. What's interesting is uh, when you get to Europe, there are a number of I would say country specific domestic marketplaces that are that are really quite large uh, and that are really seeing a big uptick in in the number of international sellers that are coming onto that platform so you know if you just sort of you know call out a couple of examples um you know france is obviously a very big market um so there you have some of the local players like in the, there'd be um fnec um Darty, and probably the top one in terms of international sellers is a marketplace called c discount so um, you know, C discount. I guess you could say that you know they're a little bit equivalent of, of Walmart uh, in terms of the brand, the recognition, um, but also in terms of the, the tools that they're available in their platform. So C discount is probably one of the fastest growing um, European marketplaces. Not in terms of you know GMV growth percentage wise, but in terms of the number of sellers that are jumping onto that marketplace uh, as an as an additional opportunity there. Um, there's, you know, in, in the Netherlands, uh, you know, they have a very large established player, actually. Amazon is, is quite new. Uh, it's called bull.com, um, you know, very, very strong, but again, very much locally, right? So very few of these marketplaces, they, they talk sort of across European game, but very few have truly achieved that. Um, and then, of course, Eastern Europe, uh, where you have Allegro, which is, you know, very, very strong and really a... a by far the number one player. You know, Amazon's only just entered Poland. Uh, you know, and Eastern Europe particularly has been uh, not a massive focus for them yet. I think it's changing. But you know, again, some really strong marketplaces too. But as you go around in Europe, you'll find there's one or two players in each different country uh, where there's options there to to sell your products and and grow your sales. Um, you know, and especially now, of course, with with Brexit and UK not being as straightforward, it's good to look at some of these other options uh, and even. You know, we've talked about, you know, obviously all of the challenges notwithstanding around, you know, getting products into um, Amazon FBA. Uh, but if you have gotten there, and remember, you know, Amazon does have the the sort of, you know, pan-European and also the omni-channel fulfillment network. Um, so you can actually start uh, dispatch your products straight from your Amazon warehouse to some of the other marketplaces as well. So, again, that just, it's another lever just to keep complexity and cost under control as well. Hmm. There's lots of opportunity out there, folks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A long, you know, just to give you a perspective, right? So we have we we connect to 70 of the sort of top 100 marketplaces globally. Now, that sounds like a really interesting stat, uh, but that gives us 
reasonable coverage in Europe, really good coverage in North America and a bit of Australia, right? So, you know, just imagine how many different marketplaces are out there, you know, uh, in, I would say, I mean, it would be, you know, a couple of hundred, you know, of course there's thousands, but you know, there'll be at least a couple of hundred where you'd say, actually, these are meaningful marketplaces with really big audiences that, you know, you're likely to, you know, drive some some meaningful sales on if you were to list your products there. So, you know, and every day I can't keep up. I think just last month in Australia, we saw two new marketplaces. And these are not small ones. These are really big, you know, one launched by our, you know, one is about to be launched by, you know, Woolworths, which is, our, you know, our largest supermarket here in Australia. Um, you know, everyone is is jumping on board uh, to launch to launch marketplaces and, uh, you know, extend their offer to uh, to their consumers. Mm. Yeah, Amazon takes out a big piece of the pie. I guess you can just keep making slices, right? <laughs> you just create create more uh, more marketplaces doing that. Um, yeah, no, that that's awesome. I I feel like every time that I hear you talk, I hear something absolutely new. I didn't even know there were seventy in the world. I am so close minded here in the U.S. I thought there were like I the ten he, that yeah the ten that we have in the U.S. Maybe or I don't even know how many we have in the U.S. But the top ten that I could think of and. That was just spread throughout the world. Yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't know until we had thing. the roundtables. <laughs> it is. It probably is. It's very yeah. ignorant. Me. Um, I should be more more informed, definitely. Um, but that's Paul, why we is had there, Paul on. That's exactly why that's we have why Paul he's on. Here. <laughs> <laughs> we say it's for everybody uh, else. This is really just to educate ourselves. Like very selfish of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Paul, is there a uh, a piece of advice uh, that you would give a growing seller uh, when it comes to expansion? I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, yeah we should no, be no, kinder to uh... our guests and like prep them like like Yoni does. Yeah. He think about it's this. a conversation. <laughs> feel feel free to send me the questions in advance. Um, <laughs> Well, the first piece of advice, of course, is make sure you get a good night's sleep every night. Sleep is really important. Uh, no, it's that applies to everyone, by the way, including and you. hydration. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and a good cup of coffee. Um, you can there drive so much more sales with a strong coffee in the hand. Um, <laughs> so you know that is it's amazing what it does to the brain. Um, no, look, I think look, there's so many ways to answer the question. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is if you're entering a new marketplace, um, start small in terms of product range. So let's say, let's say you're selling 50 products on, on Amazon and, and you've, been, you know, you've just opened up a Walmart account. Don't just shove all 50 across, right? I would say, do your research, pick, the, pick five. Pick five of your existing products and start with those on Walmart. What five focuses you to do is to really get those products right and learn about the platform. So you know, try and avoid the sort of uh, call it the, the the spray and pray. Actually, you know, acknowledge the fact that all platforms are different, and you're probably going to, have to learn some new things. And there's probably some things you're going to work out that you didn't know before that are very different to Amazon. So start small and really push those products as hard as you can. Because uh, all those learnings you're gonna you're gonna take up, then you'll be able to translate to the other 45 that are coming. Right? So um, you know, accelerate, invest to accelerate your learnings about that new marketplace that you might be selling on. Uh, you know, upfront. Um, that's probably one. And if I can throw another one, um, so if you've been selling on Amazon for a while. Um, you know, it's, it's all self-serve, right? Uh, you can't really talk to Amazon. You can't really uh, do much. That's not the case for other marketplaces. So uh, particularly the smaller ones, um, and we see a lot of this in Australia, they have account managers who are very open to talking to you. Uh, and you can actually um, get free stuff from them, right? Uh, it sounds kind of crazy, but... Um, Typically, when you come on board, you can negotiate. Hey, can you give me a launch package um, on the day that I launch my store? Can I have a tile on your front page? Um, you know, you've got a maybe you've got a, a Black Friday event coming up. You know, can I feature some of my product in your main event? Um, particularly, just sort of that second tier marketplace. Um, 
they're actually really open to uh, to doing deals and and working out things and supporting you and all of that. So just because you know Amazon has always been like you know you need help, log on to Seller Central. There are twenty tools. You 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 help yourself, right? Amazon is built on a self serve model. Um, other marketplaces actually engage in a dialogue with the account manager. Uh, you know, you know, ask right, ask for stuff. Um, and you know, we've been continually surprised by by what marketplaces they have a vested interest in making you succeed, right? They they earn their referral fees and the commissions off you when you sell a lot of products. So you'd be surprised how many times you actually uh, can come up with with great collaboration uh, that drives both your sales and their business. So uh, make sure you build a relationship uh, on those marketplaces too. That's brilliant advice, Paul. I'm think I'm sure that everybody listening appreciated that and for the listener who wants to pay you in advance for the 10 years of your service <laughs> how can they get a hold of you <laughs> yeah sure uh look uh anyone uh, anyone listening in obviously i'm on linkedin so feel free to hit me up with a, a you know dm if you want to know more um or if i can, can help you in any way uh, if you know if you want to check out our tool, uh, head to our website merchantspring.io. I think there's a link on the screen right now, uh, right there. Um, we're actually we're super excited because last night we launched our uh, profitability feature for Amazon. So if you're selling across multiple Amazon stores, and you want to compare your profits across all of those stores, down from like total store P&L to individual products. Uh, go check it out. We offer a, a seven-day free trial. Uh, and uh, and we're here to support you along the way as well. So head out to our website and uh, and sign up and connect your stores and start uh, you know cutting down on on the time you spend uh, you know working through all of this in Seller Central. That is awesome! Congrats! That's a great tool. It's an exciting launch. Yes, it <laughs> is. Oh. I, I was, was going to say, we, we have... say thanks, <laughs> thanks, Lisa, but I saw someone. It is yes. turning into a this is turning into a video. Yeah, Luna came on to do the sign off. She's like, I'm done with you. She I'm did. Over. <laughs> is is that the the resident uh, office pet? That's that's the joy of the working from home yeah. thing that COVID has brought us uh, and has brought to light. I, I do get to see uh, get to see my two beautiful animals every day and. She gets to be a pain and scratch away, um, <laughs> but that, that that was beautiful, Paul. And and you know, for everyone else that is listening, uh, Paul really is one of the most genuine people that I know in, in this space, and uh, always willing to offer advice. So um, I've always enjoyed the conversations. I've enjoyed today's conversation, Paul. I really do appreciate you coming on. Yes, thank you, guys. I've been. Uh... It's been lovely talking to you. Uh, it's great to uh, worth getting up uh, early out of bed for. Uh, <laughs> so, thank you so much for having me on the show, and uh, thank you for all those great questions. Actually, you really make me think, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's great to to try and help help your listeners and, and try and share my experience. You know, not wouldn't say it's always been easy, but you know, we've some some of the things we've learned the hard way, and that means we can pass pass those learnings and experiences on to uh, those listening as well. So, thank you so much for having me. It's it's great to be on your show today. Oh, tremendous. Thank you to you, Paul. It's been incredible. And again, at, at 6 a.m. your time, good heavens. We were talking about how that, that would not be, we would not be able to give all of the insights that you have this early in the morning if it were the two of us. Um, well, for anybody listening, if you enjoyed what you heard today, which I'm sure that you did, please be sure to give the show a like, a comment, and subscribe. If you're on YouTube, be sure to ring the bell, turn on notifications so that you get pinged whenever we go live with leaders in supply chain and e-commerce like Paul. Paul, again, thank you so, so much. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening. And we will be back uh, later this week. All right, guys, talk to you soon. Thank Bye, you, guys. guys. Take care.